Oh yeah. Buckle up guys, I just put my glasses on. We about to go deep. So what's going on guys? If you remembered my last video that I made on the multiverse or AKA proof that the multiverse is proof that there's a heaven. This is how that ended up. This was my ending conclusion with all of that. So now having said all that, proof of other dimensions existing, proof of heaven, we don't know. But one thing I noticed while I was studying all of this is that the one dimension that we feel the effects of that none of these theories work without this is time. My thought, and this is just a theory, this, it's, it's just that, is that if there is a supernatural spiritual realm that exists, I think, and again, I don't know, this is one of those crazy theories that I've, I've, I have in my head, is that it exists inside the dimension of time. And so this idea led me into another really in-depth study that I did about time and about the understanding of time. So this is that video. This is the video on time and the physics of time and why I think that the supernatural could be in the dimension of time. So that's what we're gonna cover and that's what we're gonna talk about today. And so you need to understand the physics, the philosophy, the science of time and what scientists call and physicists call the problem of time because once you understand all of that, then we can start the conversation or the philosophical conversation of whether or not free will actually exists. All right, so let's get into it. And this is a quote I am sure all of you have heard. If not, then here it is. This is a quote that Einstein wrote in a letter to one of his friends concerning time and how we perceive time. He said, for us believing physicists, the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. So physicists and theorists have wondered why did Einstein say that time was a persistent illusion? And they believe that the position that he held that time is an illusion is implied by the two grounding points of all physics and science, which is Einstein's theory of relativity and the standard model for particle physics. So in the video about the multiverse, I mentioned part of Einstein's theory of relativity, but to understand time, I gotta go into it a little bit more. So, get ready, here we go. So basically, the theory of relativity shows us that time is relative, and here is why. So to understand Einstein's theory, you have to understand that there is no such thing as absolute motion or absolute rest. There's no absolute peak high point of how fast you can move and there's no such thing as absolute stillness or rest i mean as i think i'm sitting here still in this chair the earth is rotating and you get the point so objects move relative to each other so i'm going to explain this analogy and hopefully this will put things into a better perspective for you so say that there is a truck moving at 50 miles an hour and there are two kids in the back of the truck throwing a ball at 10 miles an hour <laughs> that's gotta be a funny that's hilarious now that i think about it that's hilarious but there's another kid on the ground that is not in the truck and he sees this happening he is a observer and to him the ball is being thrown at 60 miles an hour those kids are just pelting each other man so things appear differently depending on the observer but for each of the observers the laws of physics are the same. And also something to note in this whole relativity is that the speed of light is always constant. It is always the same. It is always the same for each observer. So let's say the kids in the back of the truck also have two mirrors, one here, one here. And this mirror is bouncing a beam of light back and forth. And the kid on the ground that's observing this truck going by also has two mirrors and there's a beam of light 
bouncing back and forth between the two mirrors. Now, hypothetically speaking, or theoretically speaking, if the truck was moving closer to the speed of light, and remember, the speed of light is always constant, it doesn't change, that light, that beam, would have a further distance to travel than the kid that's just stationary on the ground with his beam of light bouncing back and forth. So picture this is just stationary and the beam of light is bouncing back and forth. But if it's moving at the speed of light, then the beam has to bounce like that back and forth so you know up and down whatever so this is a greater distance to travel than this so how is it possible for one observers beam of light to travel a greater distance than the observer the kid that's just on the ground for his to travel a shorter distance well this is only possible if time is relative it's also important to note that before Einstein they thought that the speed of light was not constant which would mean that the kid on the ground that has the two mirrors and the beam of light is bouncing back and forth, that it would have been the exact, like say, say they were bouncing back and forth at the same rate, that the kids in the truck, even if they were moving, the speed of light would have sped up so that it would be able to keep up, but this is not the case. The speed of light is always constant, which is why it takes a greater distance when you're going more at the speed of light for light to travel than if you're just stationary and Hopefully you're seeing the point that I'm making. Hopefully I'm not making it confusing. I'm trying to make it as simple as possible, but these are very confusing <laughs> topics. So it's only possible if that beam of light to travel, if the beam of light that's moving closer to the speed of light is traveling a greater distance than the beam of light that's just stationary, that's only possible if time is relative. If time wasn't relative, then the beam of light that's on the truck with the kids going towards the speed of light, tossing a ball at 60 miles an hour. The beam of light would speed up, which would mean time would remain consistent, but it's not the case. Time is relative. So basically what I'm saying is when we are moving closer to the speed of light, time slows down. And this is called time dilation. So this is only the special theory of relativity. Obviously this evolves into the general theory of relativity that Einstein came up with 20 some years later, but we don't really need to get into that. What you need to know from what I just told you is that time is relative. And as you move closer to the speed of light, time slows down. I probably could have just said that, but I gotta be all confused. <laughs> It's still hilarious to me. Two kids chucking a ball at each other in the back of a truck. So that explains one of the grounding points of science and physics. The second one is the standard model of particle physics, and I'm just going to sum it up as fast as I can. So I'm just going to read it straight from the notes that I have in front of me, which is why I'm wearing my glasses in the first place. In the standard model, you got 12 particles of matter, which is six quarks and six leptons governed and held together by the four forces the strong nuclear force the weak nuclear force the electromagnetic force and gravity that are caused by the exchange of three particles which is for each of the forces but gravity does not have a particle because they have not found a particle for gravity yet which is interesting because Gravity, we feel the effects of it all the time, yet there's no particle for it. They haven't found a graviton. And by the way, if they did find a graviton, then it would prove string theory, which would be the theory of everything, just FYI. So all the matter in the universe is made up of like a hundred different elements, but all matter is made up of atoms. And all the atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. But when you look deeper into these atoms, that's when you get the 12 particles that I talked about and with all the forces and such. So essentially, with those three things, the, the uh, protons, neutrons, electrons, with those three elements, you could create the entire framework of the universe. You could create an entire universe. Now, with these underlying facts about the universe, these underlying, these grounding points, which is Einstein's theory of relativity and the standard model of particle physics, they are both time symmetric. So the ideas of time symmetry or symmetry itself in uh, physics, which I'm going to explain what symmetry is and why that matters, but the idea of symmetry wasn't super popular and it wasn't straightforward and upfront in science until Einstein came along. So before Einstein came along, instead of looking at symmetry, because it was looked at as just kind of like this grounding underlining principle, but what Einstein proposed is we put symmetry 
in the forefront of all of our equations, all of the things in science. He proposed that symmetry is what holds the laws of nature together. And his ideas of doing this and his theoretical, everything that it did, it led to the theories of relativity. The, masterpiece in physics and science. So to say all that, I'm just telling you that symmetry is a big deal. So symmetry is divided into three parts when talking about Einstein's theory, particle physics, quantum physics. It's divided into three different parts. The first is C and it stands for change. And that's basically the difference between positive and negative energy. And then there is P as in parity. And this is basically the difference between left and right. And then there is T, which stands for time. And that is the difference between past and future. Now C and P change in parity. Those parities through experiments have been broken. And what that means is if, let's say P for example, if P was not broken, then that would mean the particles would not know the difference between left and right. But it has been broken and so particles do know the difference between left and right. And since C was broken, they know the difference between negative and positive energy. But T has not been broken. The universe on a particle level does not know the difference between past and future. It can tell us between positive and negative energy. It can tell us the difference between left and right. It can tell us what's real and what's not if it's looking in a mirror, which is another form of parody but it cannot tell us the difference, and if there is a difference, between the past and the future. And let me tell you how much of a big deal this is. If T, if time, the symmetry of time was broken, it would disprove Einstein's theory of relativity and quantum physics as we know it today. It has yet to be broken, but if it was, then it would disprove Einstein's theory and quantum physics. So because time is symmetrical, where it's obvious if you play a video of someone cracking an egg open back and forth, we would be able to tell which is going which is going forward and which is going backward. But on a cellular, on a particle level, this is you don't you can't see that. And this kind of thing, talking about breaking an egg open, going from order to chaos is called entropy. And entropy is something which it's basically the degree of disorder in a, a closed given system. Entropy is occurring throughout the universe and that is something that you cannot reverse. And this is also known as the second law of thermodynamics. And it should be noted that even though entropy is taking course throughout our entire universe, basically saying that there's order and then it's being driven into chaos, which is just the law of thermodynamics. That's just the way it is throughout our entire universe. It should be noted that also things are born. Also, you know, human cells gather together in a womb and then a human is born. Planets, galaxies, stars form, people grow, people heal, things are creative, not everything dies. So basically there's three laws of thermodynamics, but the second law is the one of entropy. And it's said that entropy, like I said, in any given system, entropy will always increase. And the system will always move towards something called thermal equilibrium, which is the maximum state of entropy in a system. And that'll make a little bit more sense here in a moment. But from this idea that entropy goes to a point of reaching equilibrium, we get a very interesting philosophical question. That since entropy is constantly expanding throughout our universe, why after 13.8 billion years has our universe still not reached a place of equilibrium? So why am I talking about the second law of thermodynamics and entropy? Well, when we're talking about time being symmetric, it's noted that this law of entropy can happen the same way going forward in the future and it can happen in reverse in the past. There's nothing about the law that says that entropy only happens in a forward motion of time because it's symmetric that it can the same way it happens entropy happens going into the future if we played it in reverse, it would also happen the same way. So what is causing our perception of time to only be able to perceive time as going forward? Interestingly enough, we have no idea, but 
there are some theories that physicists have come up with. So we're going to talk about those now.